Thank you so much. That's great. Now, I want to speak to you a bit tonight uh, from my heart uh, about, about a, a situation that I, I think you ought to be cautioned about. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own experience in the early days of my ministry that leads up to the position that we've taken down through the years as an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. Amen. The Bible tells me that uh, two cannot walk together except to be agreed. And uh, you just have to have that agreement if you walk together. Now, you may walk together reluctantly. You may be compelled to walk together at times. You may walk together denying self to do so. For the sake of peace, you might walk together for a while. But to walk together for a long journey, a lifetime journey, you must have some fellowship, some agreement. A husband and wife situation would never endure without some agreement uh, about fellowship and about convictions, and about standards and about faith and about the church and so forth. You have to have that in order to have constant fellowship down through the years. When I was when I was called to preach uh, as a young man of 25 in South Carolina, there, there were no independent churches to my recollection. There might have been one here in the city of Greenville. Uh, the Southside Baptist Church is the oldest uh, independent Baptist church in Greenville. And it was founded as a result of the ministry of Dr. William Pettingill. Uh, Dr. Pettingill was one of the co-authors of the Scopio Reference Bible. And I can remember when Dr. Dean Crane at Pillar Street uh, brought uh, Dr. Pettingill to Greenville in great premillennial conferences. Dr. Crane was a premillennialist. And at the church at Pillar Street, he'd have meetings and the second coming was preached. Well, now that's a bit strange for, for Southern Baptists. They don't all have to do that. I do not know of one single Southern Baptist school, uh, seminary or college, or even Bible Institute that is strictly premillennial. Not one. There may be a, a teacher here and there that has convictions on the premillennial return of Christ, but as an institution, not one in the entire Southern Baptist Convention that I know of. They are postmillennial or amillennial, one or the other. But Dr. Crane brought Pettingill here, and people became interested in the doctrine of the second coming. And I can remember when I first heard about the second coming of our Lord, uh, to recollect it in my mind. Now, I'm talking about, about 1927, 28, 29. And then I first began to hear some preaching about the second coming of our Lord in the old gospel tabernacle here in the city of Greenville in the early 30s and, and uh, during the 30s, and, and became interested myself in the premillennial doctrine. And then uh, a Scopio Bible fell into my hands, and I eagerly devoured the content of the Scopio Bible in relation to uh, the Second Coming and the signs of the Second Coming, the Rapture, and uh, the Antichrist, and uh, the Tribulation period. I devoured that because it was something relatively new that had not been taught uh, in the pulpit where I was read up, not to my recollection. I don't recall it having been taught. Certainly was not taught in the literature. And all my lifetime, I was been a Sunday school boy, and I carried the uh, quarterly in my hip pocket. But I've never carried a quarterly that had a lesson on the premillennial second coming of our Lord. It was always strictly and conspicuously omitted. Well, when I began to hear as a young man of why I was called to preach in 1940, that there is a premillennial return of Christ, naturally I became concerned about that, greatly concerned about it, and tried to learn all I could about the premillennial doctrine. But uh, in that day, uh, all Southern Baptist churches were peas in the same pot as far as Sunday school literature is concerned, or the, had the literature out of Nashville, and none of that had any mention at all of the premillennial return of Jesus our Lord. And uh, then when God called me in 1940, uh, I went back to school in 42, 50 years ago last year, last uh, September, I, I, I went to Furman as a freshman, uh, 1942, and four years I... I studied at Perman and graduated in, in uh, May or June, I've forgotten which, of 1946. And I heard no premillennial doctrine. I heard some criticism of it, but no premillennial doctrine at all. And uh, I, I was exposed to some liberalism, and uh, I was Southern Baptist as they were. I was saved in a Southern Baptist church and baptized in a Southern Baptist church and knew nothing but Southern Baptist uh, people up until I began uh, to hear these things later on in life. And uh, then I started pastoring in 1942, and I pastored five years at morning, 
and I pastored nine years at First Baptist Church of Pelham, and then I've been here 41 years, only three churches I've ever pastored. Well, the first two were Southern Baptist churches. I was not a cooperating Southern Baptist. I was in the convention, but neither of the churches I pastored had anything to do with the cooperative program. I learned, even as a young man, that it supported liberalism in the schools, and uh, no doubt modernists on the mission fields, and I couldn't conscientiously lead our church to give the money to the cooperative program. But uh, we were in it, and we gave money to other institutions, and by doing that, we participated as Southern Baptists. And then the Lord began to lead me in uh, about 1950, one and two, about uh, withdrawing from the uh, conviction and uh, establishing an independent fundamental church. By that time, there were several independent churches in Greenville, uh, Spring, Springwood, later called Boulevard, and then uh, Brother Waters down at Lawrence, and, and maybe three or four other independent churches in the area. Uh, Tabernacle was the fourth independent church in our city. There were three here. Hampton, Hampton Park was uh, one of the early independent churches, and then Tabernacle came in number four. And uh, I, I, I'm so happy that the Lord led me to take a, a stand with independent, fundamental Bible believers. I didn't necessarily have to take that stand. I could have stayed with the convention as some of my uh, schoolmates did. I could call the name of half a dozen men, preacher men, with whom I was at Furman. And as far as I know, off the cuff, I'm the only independent of the group. And uh, they are my friends until this day. And I appreciate that fact. I don't find fellowship with them. And the thing that separates they from me is not necessarily what I am, it's where I stand, you see. I, I've done more preaching than, than all the rest of them put together, as far as I know. But I don't believe like they believe. In the, in the forties, the Sunday School portalists began to put out advertising on the back cover of the RSV Bible. The RSV Bible. And uh, I didn't like that. I saw enough of it to know that it was greatly different from my King James. And I'm talking about 1947 and 8 and 9, a long time before the church was born. And while I was still in the Southern Baptist, I didn't like that. And I wrote a letter, if I remember correctly, uh, to the uh, Sunday School Board protesting the advertising of the RSV Bible on Southern Baptist literature. I'd never known anything but the King James all my life. Right? And I was completely satisfied with it until this day. Well, my letter of objection did no good. They passed it up, I'm sure, and still would pass it up. But I didn't like it. And when I had the opportunity, when this church was born, uh, we said we'll go independent. I was naive enough uh, to file an application with our deacons for membership of the Greenville Baptist Association in 1952, when this church was born. And uh, the leaders of the association said, now, you deacons and the pastor had to come before a committee will approve your application. We went. And they put me on trial. Instead of the deacons or the church, they put me on trial. And they asked all kinds of questions about what I believed and if I cooperated or if I planned to put in the RAs and the GAs and the Missionary Society and all the other auxiliaries. And I said, no, we don't plan to have anything but Sunday school and preaching. And not even the young people service. We didn't plan any youth service at all. Just preaching in Sunday school. Well, they didn't like that at all. Will you use the literature? And I said, no, we won't use the literature. Not Southern Baptist. So we began using Union Gospel Press. And we used the Union Gospel Press for several years. But they, uh, after a while, capitulated and began to promote the uh, new translation of the Bible in that early day before the market became flooded as it is now. But uh, we, uh, we uh, used uh, Union Gospel Press. Then there was a day when I had to write to Union Gospel Press and say, cancel our order. Uh, we can't take it to more your literature. You're leaning in the same direction as Southern Baptists. And so we canceled the order and began to study the Bible book by book like we do today. I was skeptical and afraid with fear and trembling. I was afraid that we might be making a mistake. But it proved to be the greatest lesson I've ever had in my life as far as Bible study is concerned. Taking the Bible just like it is, book by book, and studying the Bible just like it is in our Sunday school. We've done that ever since. Here we are in 1993. I'm talking about 1954 or 5 or 6 in those early days. We stopped using the literature. We have used the Bible ever since. Well, when I stepped out of the convention, and it was so known, and by the way, the committee said, we can't accept you. 
You'll have to put in all the auxiliaries. You'll have to fully organize the church uh, before we can accept you. And we'll put you on probation for a year or two, and then we might take you in. And uh, we left that meeting. I told the deacons, uh, let me have that application. They handed it to me, and I tore it in half and threw it away. And I said, deacons, we'll never go into commission. We're independent. We're independent now forever till I die. And I still have that same conviction. And the straw that breaks the camel's back uh, is the faulty translation of the Bible, is the modernism at Furman, is the liberalism at the seminaries, is the worldly standards of Baptists in general. If you think there's no difference between this church and an ordinary Baptist church in Greenville, visit one of them some Sunday. See the difference in the dress standards. The ladies don't dress like our ladies. You see the difference. You'll see it if you observe plenty of difference. And I saw that difference and I said, I don't want that. I don't want to be part of that. And so I became an independent in the middle 50s and have been so or will be until I come to die. And the reason is because of the convictions that I felt in my heart about the Bible and about the doctrines of the Bible. When I learned that uh, uh, modernists like Neil Zestray offered a lecture at Louisville, uh, I couldn't get uh, interested in that. When I learned that some of the professors didn't believe in the virgin birth, I couldn't get interested in that. When I saw the wilderness, even at Furman, and the liberalism right here in our city, I couldn't get interested in that. I'm not interested in it now. I'm not about to become involved in it. Not at all. We're still as independent in 1993 as we were in 1953 or 54. And shall always be as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we, we lost nothing, lost nothing by being independent. I think God smiled upon us and made this church the largest in this area, membership-wise. Tabernacle for years has been the largest uh, church in Greenville County of any denomination. And I give God praise for that. I didn't necessarily think that would happen. When the church was born, I had no idea that it would happen. God did it. I didn't do it. The Lord did it. And I'd be a traitor on God if I backed up now. I'm not about to back up. No way that I can back up. I still hold in my heart strong convictions about this Bible. It's God's Word without error or contradiction or mistake. I still have a strong conviction about the virgin birth. I believe Jesus is virgin born. I still have strong convictions about the physical resurrection of Jesus, our Lord, on the third day. I still have strong convictions about his second advent, some golden daybreak. He's coming back. I believe that then, I believe it now. I still, I still have strong convictions about salvation by grace through faith without the deeds of the law. Still believe that with all my heart. Baptism doesn't help you be saved. Doing good works doesn't help you be saved. You're saved by faith and the other th things you do because you are saved. I still believe that until this day. I still have strong convictions about the autonomy of the local church. Amen. Amen. The word autonomy means the freedom of a local church. There are no bishops over the local church. I believe that then. I believe that now. Amen. Right. The Association of Missionary has no authority at Tabernacle. This congregation operates this church. Amen. And the one pastor leads it best he can. Amen. And nobody on the outside has anything. But I'm still convicted about that. Amen. Now, it would be rather difficult for me to arm and I put my arm in the arm of a man that didn't believe those things and sit down with him and work with him and worship with him. It would be hard for me to do that. In other words, if, if I had to fellowship uh, in worship or in a ministry, with a man who didn't believe in the virgin birth, what common ground do we have? I'd be in a straight jacket, so to speak. I'd be bound up. I couldn't do that. Right. Nor can you do that. How can two walk together? Amen. Except that we agreed. And then the scriptures command us and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Now, a liberal and a modernist is not a believer. You that are saved by grace through faith are believers in Jesus Christ Amen. and his word. But you find a man that's a liberal, he's not a believer. And if he's not saved, then he isn't your brother. And you're forbidden to yoke up 
with unfaithful people and unbelieving people. And I'm forbidden to yoke up with unbelieving people. I can love them and I can help them if I can, but I'm not to yoke up with them. In religion or in matrimony or in business, I'm not to yoke up with unbelievers. And you aren't either. But uh, we, we've come a long way since those early days that I've been talking about. Uh, when Tabernacle was the fourth independent Baptist church in Greenville County, and now we have 50, 50, we've counted them, 50 independent Baptist churches now county, Greenville County. And there are 350 Southern Baptist churches in Greenville County, and 50 independents. We've come a long way since those early days. But I've seen some handwriting on the wall that disturbs me. I've seen a letting up, and I'm talking to you out of my heart now, because I'll be gone in a few days. You're going to face it and remain true or compromise and lose your blessing. I see some things as handwriting on the wall that make me feel badly about the future of independent fundamental Baptist people. And I think the, the worst thing I see about the future of independent Baptist churches uh, is the compromise that I see in churches and congregations that one time stood for the Bible, it stood for, for holy living, stood for tithing, stood for evangelism, stood for separation from the things of the world, have now lit up. And it's not so bad to dress like the world and act like the world anymore in some independent Baptist churches. And that disturbs me. I've seen some preachers, some of the graduates of our Bible college. And we didn't start the Bible college just to have something to do four nights a week. God led us to start the Bible college in 1963. And I, I, I've given 30 years of my life teaching on one and Tuesday night in the Bible college. I've taught every graduate we sent out, except this year. I have not taught this year. Brother Kennedy took my classes in September. But I gave 30 years of my life teaching. But I've, I've seen some of my graduates soften up and let up. And uh, when they do, uh, they usually whisper about the preacher. Uh, they say he's getting old. No, it's not my age that bothers some people. It's my gospel. Right. And I want to say to you that the gospel I preach hasn't changed one bit. I preach and believe the same thing now that I did 54 years ago. Don't plan to change. And I see that. And I, I, I want the preacher boys that are here now to listen to that. I don't want that to happen to you. Why should it happen to you? Well, I want to get along with people and I like to preach in other churches. Well, you can decide whether you want to compromise and preach in other churches or stay true to the Bible and fight the good fight of faith by yourself. Let me say this to you. When I, when I became an independent uh, 40 years ago, 41 years ago, when the church was born, the Southern Baptist crowd dropped me like I was a hot potato. It had nothing to do with me. And I used to preach. I have dates written in my Bible. With this Bible, I preached in churches that are Southern Baptist. And I wrote down the name of the church on the date I preached a certain sermon. I used to do that. And several pages of my book contain that information. But when I became independent and came to Tabernacle, that was when I was passing at Pelham and morning. When I came to Tabernacle, I was dropped. I never go into a Southern Baptist church. And uh, they say, where'd you go? Well, that's a hypothetical question. I don't get an invitation. So I don't have to make any decision. I just don't go. No invitation. You can't go without an invitation. And you believe me, I can't remember the last invitation I had from a Southern Baptist church to preach in a meeting. I can't remember. Been a long time. And, uh, and I don't expect to get any. The price I had to pay to be an independent, Bible-believing, fundamentalist without any apology is what I'm trying to talk to you about. There is a price involved. And some people are not willing to pay that price. And that's why some people uh, don't like to be a member of a church like Tabernacle. They like what we're doing, 
They love the grounds of the beautiful buildings and the clean grounds and they love the radio station and they love the children's home and they love uh, the widow's apartments and they love other things that we do. But they don't like that stigma. He's an outspoken fundamentalist. And they don't like that. Well, I can't change. I don't plan to change. And you're going to have to, you young preacher, you're going to have to make up your mind which route you're going to travel. Another thing that disturbs me uh, as I grow older about the independent movement is that we have some Baptist preachers who are trying to work both sides of the fence. We have some singers that are working both sides of the fence. One week they were with an independent church, the next week they were with a Southern Baptist. When I find a preacher like that, I let him alone. And I found a few. I can call the names, but I don't plan to do that. But I find some that I work on both sides. I find some Southern Baptist preachers that home churches than the new Southern Baptists. And then I find some independent Baptist preachers that hold some meetings in independent churches, but many in Southern Baptist churches. Now that can't honestly be done. You're going to have to be dishonest to do that. When you're preaching for Southern Baptist, how are you going to keep your mouth shut about modernism in the convention, in the seminaries, and in the schools? How are you going to keep your mouth shut about the way people dress? How are you going to keep your mouth shut about the Masonic order? And on down the line. Compromise. Well, if you're in that kind of business, help yourself. But I'm not getting in that kind of business. Haven't been not about to start now. I'm speaking to all of you, but in particular, the young preachers. Now, uh, I would not invite a man to preach in this pulpit uh, who is Southern Baptist. And I have dear friends who are. When we first started, we did have several Southern Baptists. I uh, see this thing has grown up uh, in in my lifetime. In the early days of our church, in the fifties, and maybe in the sixties, we might have had four or five Southern Baptists in this pulpit. But uh, in latter years, the last twenty-five years, none, none. There won't be any more. No, our paths instead of going together, have gone apart. Over the Bible, over the doctrines, over the standards, over what Baptists believe, and so on. Over the independence of a local church, the autonomy of a local church uh, has divided Baptist people greatly. And I see these trends that bother me. And I, I want you to know exactly where I stand. And if you hear of a Southern Baptist preacher uh, coming into the area and you want to hear him preach, you go to your classes. Don't you skip classes. To hear that man preach. Right. I don't care who he is. You meet your class. That's right. And if you have some doubt about a man, you come ask me and I'll tell you flat footed whether you ought to hear him or not. Or support him or not. I think we'll take a stand. We took a stand in 1952 when the church was born. We took a stand. Those deacons that were with me then in that meeting a mission while ago are all dead now except one. Fellow Nelson was one of them. And uh, I can name two of the others, but they're all gone. But we took a stand, and the church took a stand, and we've been standing there all these years. But we've reached a point in our history where some standards have been let down, and some doctrines have been whitewashed, and some preachers have decided that they can work both sides, and there are two or three preachers that set out to bring all Baptist people together. And you can't do that. No, you can't do that. God doesn't want that. God wants every church to be local, autonomous, and independent. I'm thoroughly convinced. Now, let's pay that price and, and say, Now, Lord, I want to be true to the Bible. You yoke up with many Southern Baptists and, and all the Methodists. I have no fellowship with Methodist people. I don't hate any Methodists. I couldn't call the name of two Methodist pastors in Greenville. And I've been here longer than all of them. I, I, can, I, I can't call the name of over two Presbyterian preachers. I have no concord with them, no fellowship with them. They're not going down the same road that I'm going down. They don't believe the gospel as I believe it. Well, you think you're right and everybody's wrong. No, I didn't say that. You said that. No, I, I don't think I'm necessarily right. 
I believe I am right about doctrines. And I'm so right until I'm not about to dip my colors. Years ago, they said, you need to join the Greenville Ministerial Union. I said, no, I think not. And so I've never attended a ministerial union in my life. Well, evidently, they don't miss me. They don't come around to say we missed you. They don't bother with me. He said, you don't bother them. That's right. But that's a two-way highway. Neither do they bother with me. I have no contact with them. They have none with me. Not at all. Uh, they never invite me to their meetings. If Southern Baptists wanted to have a graduate of Furman, a boy that was baptized and called in a Southern Baptist church, and they wanted to help me, there's a lot of ways they could do it. But they don't want to help me. I believe what I believe now when I was in the Southern Baptist Convention. I have moved to Peg. They're the ones that's moved. I moved not a bit. They've moved. I haven't. I preached. I expected more colleges, Bible colleges anyway, than any preacher in this state. I can name them. All over America, I preached in Arlington College in Fort Worth and uh, Springfield Baptist College, BBF College, Howard yeah. Edison College, you name them, all over this country, Calvary College in St. Louis and Kansas City and other places I preached in meetings and churches and in Bible colleges all over the country, in conferences and chapel services many times, many times at, uh, at Tennessee uh, Temple and many other schools I preached in. But I never get an invitation to any Southern Baptist school. Does that strike you? Never. I've never been invited to even come on the campus of Furman. When I graduated from there in 1946. I've never been invited to any Southern Baptist school. Not one. Not one. Years ago, I attended chapel one time at Fruitland, the little Bible institute up in Hendersonville, operated by Southern Baptists. But I, I, if I remember, I didn't speak in this tender chapel of somebody. But that's been a long, long time ago. While I was yet Southern Baptist, by the way. But they don't have anything to do with me. You'd think I was a criminal. I don't think I am. My name is good as theirs. I can borrow the money from the same bank they borrow theirs from. They're from. But uh, it's my stand. It's my convictions. It's what I believe about the Bible. That's caused what I'm talking about. Will I dip my colors now in order to find fellowship with a group of unbelievers and modernists and liberals? Never, never, never. And I say that to you young preachers. You decide now which road you're going down. If you're going to stay with the Bible, then let it be known. If you're going to be wishy-washy and stand with anybody anytime, anywhere, let it get out on you in a hurry. Just can do that and it'll get out on you. But if you decide to stand where you ought to stand for the Bible, then let it be known. Let it be known. And don't let anybody move you from the ancient landmarks that our fathers have set. I find nothing wrong with this Bible. Not a thing. I want to know more about it and do more about it, but I certainly find nothing wrong with it. And I want to preach it till my last day and defend it to my last breath. Right. And I will not compromise the scriptures in order to find fellowship with anybody. And I have some friends, by the way, that are Southern Baptists. But our friendship is limited. There's a certain point I dare not cross, nor they. It's a limited, it's a strained fellowship. It's not a warm fellowship like I'm used to among those of like precious faith independence. I don't want you to go out and hate anybody or try to hurt anybody. But I don't want you to hurt the independent movement either. I don't want you to hurt this Bible. I don't want you to hurt this church. I don't want you to hurt Tabernacle Baptist College. Time or two, we've had two or three students graduate, send their diplomas back. They found out that I was a fanatic and they didn't want to keep their diplomas. One or two, not over that. And we've graduated more than 500. If they didn't want the diplomas, send them back. Well, if I was you, I'd do the same thing. If you're going to compromise, I wouldn't accept a diploma. But if you're going to stand true to the Bible, then let nothing stop you. Move on. Now, what I've said tonight will not help my situation any. 
not at all. And I didn't say it in order to cause trouble. But I said what I've said to tell you that we're to stay with the stuff, stay with the book, stay with your church, stay with Tabernacle, stay with all those 400 missionaries that we support are independent Baptists. Every one of them. And I'm not in the notion of giving up on any one of them and cutting any one of them support off. If they'll stay with this book, we'll stay with them as long as we can. And I want you to do the same thing. And to be happy. If somebody throws it at you that you're independent, just smile and say, praise God, I am. Hallelujah, I am. That's exactly what I am and have been all these 41 years. An independent Baptist preacher. Fundamental. Don't be ashamed of that word fundamental. The word simply means I take the Bible at face value. That's the fundamentalist. If I had a prescription in my pocket, a doctor might have given me, and I carried it to the drugstore, and the drugstore man said, I can feel that, but I have to change it a little bit. I say, let me have my prescription. I want to feel exactly like the doctor wrote it out. And if you can't feel my prescription, give it back to me. I'll care where I can get it filled. And if you can't handle the Word of God honestly and correctly, then sit down and twiddle your thumbs and refuse to do anything. Don't change your convictions. Have it all stand for the Lord. And God will bless you if you'll do that. God bless you. May we stand together, please. I want to help our people not to be enticed to compromise. The other side of the fence may look popular and it may be well uh, populated with important people. And I want to get in that crowd. Lord, let me stand with your crowd. Where I find your people, that's where I want to stand. And when I say your people, Bible-believing people, Christian people, uh, witnessing people, shouting people, singing people, let me stand with your people, Lord. And I pray that all the members of my church, and in particular I pray for our Bible college students, that they too may just stand by the stuff until their last day. In Jesus, we pray. Heads are bowed. We're going to sing an invitation song. Could be somebody ought to come to the altar. Could be somebody here who would say, I'd like to be a member of Church Life Tabernacle, and I'd like to join this church tonight. You may come, and we'd be glad to have you uh, present yourself for baptism or for church membership as God may lead. But the only way we sing.